Hi everyone, this is Gautam. Hi guys, this is Harish. So um, uh, today, I mean, we are actually prepared to talk about both triggers and actions, but uh, as we were sort of putting the material together, we just realized that maybe there's a lot of things to cover just in triggers. So, uh, uh, so there's a chance that we may uh, run out of time. And as always, uh, keep the questions coming. Um, um, so, um, I, I, of, I mean, sort of at the heart of uh, what Workado does, there is the, you know, what we call as recipes. I mean, recipes are a, st uh, uh, a set of instructions. Some people think of them as scripts. Uh, I think that's a sort of good way to think about it. But these are scripts that, you know, uh, you don't have to be a Unix system administrator or someone very technical uh, to be able to create. So uh, uh, anyone uh, with some level of uh, technical background should be able to create uh, these uh, recipes. Uh, recipes have two components. There is a trigger mechanism, and then, you know, when that trigger event occurs, the set of actions that you want to take. So, um, so there. So when you uh, think about triggers, um, uh, there are three sort of distinct things about a trigger that are sort of important to call out. Um, um, the the first is the trigger mechanism, and just just to sort of I mean uh, to sort of reiterate, trigger is the external event that. Uh, that sort of uh, gets your recipe to do work and doing work in this context is executing the set of actions and it can be an external event but it can also be a scheduled event. What would be a good example for a trigger? Um, for example, uh, a new uh, order is created in your SAP system or a new order is created in Salesforce. Uh, it could also be an opportunity that actually changed. So uh, triggers don't always have to be about new, uh, something uh, new being created, it can also be about changes. Um, um, so, um, Harish, what sort of, I'll, why don't I go into the mechanisms of how the, the, the sort of, uh, the, the trigger uh, actually uh, functions? Basically, uh, I guess, triggers kind of capture the external events and then they bring it to the work harder side for us to process. That, that, that's correct. So, um, th that's right. And actually, that, that's a, uh, so, um, uh, you know, when something happens in an external application, uh, um, uh, Workato, when you use a Workato trigger, the trigger's job becomes to identify that what you were interesting happened or not, and we use APIs to do that. And then once, uh, and then there are different applications work differently. So for example, if it is uh, Zendesk, Zendesk supports webhooks, so we are actually able to to register a webhook within Zendesk to notify us when a, a, a ticket is created or updated. So in the, in so there the mechanism that we would use. I mean, it's it sort of fall under the umbrella of real time, but we are and in that the actual technology used would be webhooks. Oftentimes, uh, many applications do not support a real time interface, so we are we actually then end up having to pull. So we'll use their standard API. To, uh, and we'll pull at a specific interval. I mean, it sort of varies from five minutes and it goes up from there. And uh, it would periodically go query the application to see if there's any data available for processing. Um, and then the third is basically the scheduled option. In this case, we are essentially um, going in and uh, in the trigger configuration, we are saying that every Monday morning at 9 a.m. do something. That would be the third option. So uh, um, let's actually look at these uh, from a Salesforce point of view. So here, you know, I'm selecting uh, Salesforce as the trigger and, um, and uh, as the trigger application. And then the trigger itself, you can see that there are several different things that, um, that our Salesforce connector supports. Um, the most basic of them all is new object. And we call it object. Sometimes we may call it, you know, new case, depending on the application. Mainly, if the application has a lot of objects, we would call it a new object trigger, and then we would expect the user to say which object. What is an example of an object? Because I always get confused about the concept of an object. So, I mean, typically, an object is some sort of business object, and as you can see in in Salesforce case, you know, these are all the objects: accounts, leads, opportunities. Uh, and so on. 
uh, are, 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 the, are, are the business objects. And of course, in this, you're seeing both standard objects and custom objects. So going back to the trigger, um, 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 then you also see, so this, when we, when we don't have a marker, like, you know, what I mean by that is where, like this one says real time, it basically means that that trigger works using polling. So we'd be polling every five minutes, we'd go and check Salesforce to see if the object selected has, in the case of new, has any new object been created. If I, um, so, and then if it is marked as real time, then in this case, uh, in Salesforce case, uh, they, they don't support webhooks, so they, we, we use uh, Salesforce's workflow capability to do an outbound dispatch to notify Workato. So new object, real time, uses that mechanism. And in that case, essentially, as soon as that event occurs in Salesforce, Workato is immediately notified. And then, if we scroll down further, you will see that we have the notion of a scheduled object search. And here, you would essentially specify uh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, at a sort of a time interval. You would say that Monday morning, 9 a.m. do this, or every day do this. And then, the this, in this case, is a so-called query. So that sort of covers the, you know, the, the trigger mechanism type. Right? This is sort of how 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 does Workato figure out when to uh, uh, you know how to uh, interface with that application. The next concept is the dispatch mechanism, and I mean what it's actually a simple concept when I say dispatch is a, doesn't uh, exactly capture that. But what that means is by default, when let's say we are working with Salesforce opportunities, uh, when uh, and your trigger that you have selected is a new opportunity, every time there is an opportunity, then the trigger will fire and it will deliver exactly one opportunity object to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the actions. So that is what we call as, you know, the sort of that's the singleton mode. But sometimes for throughput reasons or other reasons, you may actually want to process many orders, uh, many uh, opportunities at the same time. So for example, um, uh, uh, especially if you're doing uh, use cases where you're uploading to a data warehouse, you may not want to do them one at a time. You may want to do them, you know, at 4,000 records at a time. So that's what we would call as a batch dispatch mechanism. So, and within batch, sometimes we would use a bulk API because if you want to do really large batches in Salesforce, it's better to use the bulk API if you're looking at millions of records. So that's what the, the, those are the two variations. Process a single record at a time or process a group of uh, records at a time. So, so let's go back. Yeah, go ahead, Harish. So how do, you, how do you specify that you want to process one versus one? So in, um, the, in Workata, what we do is we actually have two types of triggers. We have a singleton trigger. So when you see new updated object, this trigger will deliver one at a time. But if you want to process them in batch, we have a batch. Uh, so you, we have a, a batch or bulk trigger where you, we you specify the batch size. So here, you know, um, uh, you can specify, you know, the, the size of the batch that uh, you want to work with, and the size of the batch varies. I mean, really, internally, it's a function of size. And this particular one uh, process them. It, it, it sort of will process 100 at a time. But it doesn't mean that if you have 1 million records, it is going to do only the first 100. It is basically what it is. It is an indication to the, to the trigger that deliver them 100 at a time. So that's the, so, uh, the, the two dispatch mechanism. And the other is uh, CRUD. Um, so what what the what so this uh, what uh, that means here in this case is uh, uh, you can have a trigger that fires when when an object is created. You can have a trigger that that fires when that object is updated. You can also have a trigger that fires when an object is deleted. So you can see a deleted object trigger here. This is a new object trigger, and then this is a new updated object. 
And also, sometimes you can also have a trigger that works off of a search result. So that's sort of you know, uh, also the, the example of that is, again, the scheduled object using uh, search using SOQL. So when you define your SOQL, it is actually going to search at a specified time as dictated by the trigger, and then it is going to bring the search results over, and then that is fed to the actions. So I just wanted to show some examples. Let's look at... So here, I mean, th this is an uh, uh, example of uh, working in batches. And here you can see that this is a really simple recipe. But what it does is it takes a batch of uh, opportunities, and then it sends them over as a batch to Redshift. So this is, this is how you, get, you can get a lot of throughput, right, in the sense that um, um, since both from a trigger perspective and from an action perspective, batch, batching is available, you can get 4,000 records at a time from Salesforce and upload them 4,000 at a time into Redshift, which, which is a tremendous uh, amount of uh, uh, performance you get from it because this Redshift, if you're doing them one at a time, you're making 4,000 network calls versus if you're just going to use the batch operation, it is a single network call. Yeah. Anything else uh, here that uh, Harish we should cover? I guess uh, you know what will be interesting is do we have batch you know mm, this pairing of batch triggers and batch actions for all of the adapters or is it? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. So um, uh, we 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 don't have it for all of the connectors uh, mainly because. Uh, largely, we, we rely on the API itself. On the trigger side, we actually could support it for a lot more connectors than we support today, but I do think we have very good coverage for batches in the trigger side. But on the action side, the, we can only offer batching if the API itself supports it. But the good news on, the, on that side is, especially when it comes to databases, which largely is the, uh, the data warehouse scenario where you need massive amounts of throughput, batching is supportive. I believe we have good support for batching in our database connectors. And outside of that, any, uh, any uh, popular app like Salesforce, we support batching. Um, um, uh, NetSuite has batching on that one. NetSuite, I know we have batching on the trigger side. I'm not sure we have it on the action side. Okay. Uh, but definitely, I think we, we, can, we can sort of uh, check up on that. Um, so hopefully, I think we covered a, a, a little bit of a detail there, but hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, um, um, that, but before we so, uh, get a little bit more deeper into triggers, just want to sort of point out what are the sort of things that the trigger provides you? What are the guarantees that work out of tr uh, triggers uh, provide you? The first is guaranteed delivery. And what that means is uh, once work out a trigger using the, you know, uh, transacts with the API on the other side and gets a piece of information, um, uh, you know, an event, if you will, work, it's guaranteed that a job will be created for that event. There's a caveat that I, I will get into, uh, 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 but basically once we sort of take that, uh, that particular triggered event, it is Workato's responsibility to make sure that a job is executed for that event. The caveat is that we also guarantee uh, no duplicates, meaning that if the same event is dispatched again by the API, uh, our duplicate detection system will filter that out. So that way you're not processing the same, so you don't want to be processing two payments, right? Uh, um, um, so, um, so we guarantee uh, duplicate detection as well. Um, in sequence delivery, um, uh, what that sort of that, that guarantee is about is that um, let's say uh, you have a use case where um, um, it's around payments, and let's say the first event is uh, pay pay hundred dollars, second event is you know uh, debit uh, fifty dollars, and third event is you know credit hundred dollars again. Uh, in a situation like that, you, you know the the order in which it is applied becomes very important. So Workato guarantees that 
the order in which the events are created are the order in which workout jobs will also be created. So, so th that, that is what this picture on the right is trying to communicate. In this case, what it is saying is trigger. The event five has uh, is sort of the, the event that is ready to be processed. Six is already available, but seven and eight are missing, uh, and but nine has showed up. And this can happen with APIs. We have seen actually this happen. And what Workato trigger will do is it will not dispatch nine until it has received seven and eight, and then it will process. So basically, after five and six are processed events will not be dispatched until Workado gets hold of seven and eight and then only nine will be dispatched. So this way you don't have to write complex recipe logic to figure out what would you do if you get an event out of sequence. It is something Workado takes care of. Um, Harish, you want to talk about flow control? Um, so um, um, uh, with flow control, um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of what you, you can have sources that can have very spiky traffic. So, you know, uh, uh, you know in a previous life, we worked on uh, trading systems and, you know, typically Monday morning Eastern, that would be, uh, you know, would be a big spike. Uh, and um, so in those cases, um, what Workato can do is the way Workato uh, triggers work is the triggers are basically listening for new events and when the new event comes in, it does an extremely fast write to a distributed queue and then responds okay. So that way, um, you know, whatever the rate of traffic because we are not sort of processing the entire job in a synchronous fashion, we can actually put it into the queue and respond back. So, and once it is in the queue, it is Workato's responsibility to process that job. So, so you get built-in flow control uh, because the queue serves as the, the uh, as the flow control device and throttles uh, um, uh, and throttles the execution. Because also sometimes your publisher is going to be much faster than your subscriber, your downstream app. You cannot write, for example, very fast into NetSuite. So you need flow control in between to make sure that you know uh, the that you can actually end up writing. You can write to NetSuite at the same rate as you know some application is producing events. Essentially, uh, you know, uh, what you're saying is the applications that are producing events, they can produce events at whatever rate that they want. And if the downstream applications like NetSuite or um, where they have API limits, you know, this will act as a natural throttling mechanism. That, that, that's right. That's right. And it is better to throttle it here than to let the downstream API throttle it because if they have rate control limits or daily limits and so on, then they, it becomes an exception, and then at that point you're dealing with you know exception processing logic. So this way, it's a Workado does the flow control in between, and uh, and you can sort of uh, you can uh, uh, you, you you get to throttle it without having to deal with exceptions that the downstream app throws. The uh, the other guarantee that we do is, uh, it's actually kind of unusual, I think, right, uh, Harish, where very few APIs actually return uh, data in reverse chronology, uh, uh, meaning that it will, it will give the, uh, the most recently processed event first. There are examples of it, uh, but it's not, the, it's not really the norm. But in also those cases, Workata will actually Deliver them work the same guarantee. Uh, the, the, uh, it will it will actually store them and deliver them in the, in the right chronology order. Yeah. So we will stage those uh, events before we start dispatching them. I guess uh, the top tier apps, uh, you know, they provide their APIs. They uh, provide controls over uh, the order of you know order in which it can be delivered. I think most of the second tier, third tier uh, SaaS apps out there. It's mm -hmm. always the newest event first. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think where it gets interesting is, uh, you know, APIs typically tend to return the first page. In this case, for us to go back in time until we find the event, uh, you know, that you have not seen, you know, uh, we, we have to do. We have to stage it. Actually, that's right. I, th I think uh, the Jira mm -hmm. uh, does it in uh, reverse chronology order. And uh, so what that means is, um, uh, yeah, 
it, it is pretty simple if they, the first page the, of the result set has to be sorted in the right order. But what Harish was just saying is sometimes it, you know, it is a paginated result set and there could be a hundred pages of results to, to sort of uh, to paginate through before getting the oldest event. So Workata will paginate through, go to the oldest event and start dispatching from there, which is where in some cases you would see that you would start the recipe, but then you, 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 saw, you think that the recipe is not actually doing any work. We actually added some additional uh, information now very recently, a few weeks back, that let, tells you what, the, what is going on. But before that, you'd be thinking, hey, is my recipe really working or not? And in those cases, it is not, not obviously all, but in many cases, it is that the recipe is paginating back to find the oldest event first and starts, starts dispatching. Because uh, uh, most of the newer apps, uh, you know, second tier or third tier apps, the APIs are built for the user interfaces rather than for services. So, That's right. Uh, so then, uh, you know, if you were to uh, write code for doing it yourself, it's going to be very, very complex uh, to stage those things. So I think we take care of um, all of those logic that you can. Again, the idea being that, you know, when you are building a recipe, you should just focus on the business logic and not have to worry about the technical uh, technical details. So what at work, how do we call us that the integration debt, uh, the set of things that you have to do that is actually not directly associated with the business logic. And then the last uh, uh, guarantee that uh, uh, Workato triggers provide is that um, that the Workato remembers the last event processed. And the reason this is important is because you may have a recipe, you, you, it is running, and then you notice that you know there, there, there are sort of there is actually a, a, a mistake in the logic, or you want to upgrade the logic, so you want to turn it off for maintenance. You want to turn not, turn the recipe off, make some changes, and then start it again. And what Workado does is because we remember the uh, the cursor position, you will not lose any events when your recipe is down. So the, it will go back to the last event process and then start processing events after that. So that way you don't have to worry about getting things, that, you know, um, about having to write again logic or a separate set of recipes to deal with what happened to all the events that I lost when my recipe was off. So the next part of, uh, of this is, is yeah, I think, we, um, is what we call as from, and it, it is um, it's kind of disguised as a really simple thing, but there's a lot of things going on here, and most Workato triggers uh, support uh, the, uh, the notion of from, and as you can see in this particular one, it is not allowing me to change it because this, uh, this recipe has been run before. So when you run it before, uh, uh, once, the, the position of the cursor is actually already saved, so we don't let you change that. Uh, so, uh, what is from? Because I think we are. Yeah. Um, I'm probably. Um, so let's go back mm -hmm. here. So, so from basically tells the tells Workato, uh, um, um, or the Workato trigger to be more specifically, when to start picking events from. So typically, the default is recipe start. So when you start the recipe, any new events created from that point onwards is what will be processed. But oftentimes, you have, let's say you're doing a synchronization recipe, and then you want to move uh, a bunch of customers that already exist in Salesforce to NetSuite, uh, you want to actually go back in time. Um, so you may, so Workout allows you to s provide a specific time um, or some of the defaults here. Um, so in this case, you know, uh, uh, last week, last month, the beginning of time basically means it'll pick every record in the in the system. And you can also do the same thing here. Right? You can enter a custom value. And so, uh, uh, so, so that is what we're trying to capture in this slide. Hopefully this actually uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, a bit clearer. Let's say the time right now is it's today 11 a.m. So if I started that recipe with the default option, it is going to pick events that get created in Salesforce from 
this point onwards into the future. If I set the, the value of from to this particular date, what it is going to do is before processing new events, Workato is going to first process the older events. Again, this goes back to the guarantee of sequential processing. It will go back and since this is the time we specified, it is going to pick up all events or let's say all uh, um, uh, customers created from that particular date onwards and then bring them all over and then it will keep them synced from that point into, into the future as well. So it will basically bring all the records between these two and then it is going to listen for, continue to listen for new uh, new customers and keep them in sync. Um, so that's that's what from is. And then once you stop the recipe, let's say we stop the recipe, um, maybe let's say at 1130, um, then we do some work and then at 1145, um, oh, anyways, it, it is 21st, okay. So, um, so I stop the, the recipe a couple days later, at this time I do a bunch of fixing and then when I start the recipe, it is going to remember that this, this was around the time the last event was processed and it's going to make sure that it picks up all the events from this before it sort of uh, processes uh, new events. It, we, we find this a little bit of a, a complex uh, topic but uh, really the the primary purpose of this is two things. One is, uh, you know, you, you should work out, the same recipe should be able to handle historical events that have happened, basically the, the, uh, the, the bootstrapping use case and continue forward. And also, when you stop a recipe for maintenance, you should not miss events. So those are the two things that sort of uh, this, um, uh, this feature addresses. I guess, uh, you know, that kind of introduces what we've seen in customers is uh, it introduces a very interesting, uh, you know, recipe development patterns. Uh, once they start using this feature, once they feel that, okay, you know, they're not going to miss the events, the changes to the recipe, uh, you know, they do quite often because in an integration scenario, uh, you know, unlike you know, when you're building a product or un unlike when you're building a static software, integration requirements keep changing. That's you know, right. your mapping requirements keep changing. So quite often, uh, you don't make those changes you know, after you release a, uh, you know, re release an integration because you fear that, okay, you know, uh, the, this modification cycle is too long and, uh, you know, downside of um, bring, bringing, a, bringing a scenario, you know, a recipe down if, is, if it is significant, you're not going to make those changes. But what we've seen is, you know, many of our customers, they continuously make changes to this in a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. That's and, right. And uh, they don't think twice about it. And these are the people who came from the proper, you know, SDLC background where in which they did uh, testing, staging, uh, deployment, those kind of things. But now they seem to, you know, look at recipes as like, uh, you know, Google's Excel spreadsheets, uh, you know, they, they make changes without worrying about, you know, mm -hmm. data loss. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a really good point and it, it has been actually quite uh, amazing to watch that and I wish we had the same thing when we did our upgrades because, for example, when we go into maintenance mode, we still have to leave all our uh, webhook gateways on and when events come in we had to persist it into a different queue so that your events don't get lost so we do that so we can provide this capability to our customers so the one question like how is this cursor managed when you copy a recipe sometimes you're reusing the same recipe you know with some different parameters so how does it work when you copy a recipe so a yeah, good question. Uh, the the cursor position is the property of the recipe, meaning that if you make a copy, the cursor position does not go with it. So uh, um, so um, then, if, if let's say you have a recipe in which you have uh, the from value set, when you copy it, it it defaults to the from value. So the cursor position, because that does be considered the transactional data. So what, where a particular recipe, what was the last event process is transactional data and not metadata of the recipe. So that does not go when you copy. In fact, when you copy, you actually almost don't want that copied because the, the job histories 
would all would sort of go. Uh, it it would not be relevant, uh, and that's why we also made it a little bit more simpler. Where we said when you when you the same recipe when you do a start and stop, we do not let people change that mainly because of that reason. We actually could support the ability to change it, but then your job history, which is a transactional log of all events that have happened, can go all right. It, it's it's a uh, that, that is uh, that is why we all sort of always sort of uh, have kept it simpler uh, and not and made it uh, immutable uh, once a recipe has started. I guess uh, I mean you could draw a parallel between job history, right? Let's say when you copy a recipe, as Gautam said, we don't copy job history because right. the, the the events that you processed in a you know a right. parent recipe, they don't get transferred to a child recipe. Right. So you know the cursor position comes once you start. You know, every recipe has its own cursor position. Okay. So the the next topic is um, uh, you know you you create a, a filter, uh, you 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 configure a trigger. You basically said I'm interested in let's say opportunities, and then you also said that you know I'm interested in opportunities from last year. Um, then the next topic allows you to actually filter them because sometimes we don't care when a uh, when an opportunity is. Uh, uh, created or updated, but we may only care if the a particular state is true, as in an opportunity was updated and the the um, uh, the uh, the status of that opportunity is close to one. So then, because if it is close to one, then you want to take a series of downstream actions, but otherwise you don't care about that. So so the ability to filter is is the next topic. So what we have here, what you see in the first one. Uh, it doesn't look probably I'm sure not very clear, but it's a it's a regular trigger. So when we have a regular trigger, um, let's uh, so this is a regular trigger. In this particular uh, configuration, this set of actions will be uh, will be um, uh, executed every time the uh, investor object, a new investor object, is created. Are updated in Salesforce, so it just uh, you know it is going to fire for every one of those use cases. Um, so um, in this particular uh, trigger, uh, this trigger uh, the the set of actions will only be executed when the stage in the opportunity object is equal to closed one. So, so what you have essentially done is instead of sort of caring about every single state transition to the opportunity object, you only you have indicated that you only care about it when the state changes to close to one. There's an additional detail here that it is it is for you know it is to sometimes you can get into a vicious loop. So that is what this is for. So I, I won't go into that. But that so the so in this case. These actions only get executed when the, uh, when the stage is close to one. So our customers like this a lot uh, for another reason as well, because when 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 an event, I mean, we call this the trigger filter, but uh, what this means is that um, all the opportunities that were filtered out uh, do not create transactions for you. So it's a way of conserving the monthly transaction you know, the, whatever the limit your plan support, this is a good way of sort of um, ensuring that you don't use, um, that you, uh, you don't use it all up. Well, well I guess uh, this, uh, I mean, probably what you're pointing at is sometimes you might have that filtering in the recipe um, body, that is, if you have it as an action line, then it's still it gets it's counted. Still, it's, it gets counted, so you can you can filter it at the trigger level, so then it doesn't. That's right. And actually, I mean, that, that that's that's a good point. I mean, sometimes you have logic there. It's it serves the same purpose, but it get it gets counted as a job, and also it really clutters up your your jobs. job history because you you have a ton of jobs there that you really don't care about. It's it becomes like a programming, uh, you know, your recipe building practice to. I'll filter them at the trigger level. So, uh, got a uh, question for uh, when you have a trigger filter, right? And we talked about the cursor. So, let's say you misspelled the closed one, right? And uh, you, the event uh, was captured, 
but you filtered it. That's right. But if you correct it, there's no way to go back. That is, uh, the, 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 the way to go back is to make a copy of the recipe. Copy of the recipe. Okay. Um, uh, beca uh, because the cursor position has moved. Right. And uh, as I was saying, it is what the, the, those are some of the use cases where right. we think we should provide the ability to change the cursor position. Right. Uh, but then the set of unintended consequences that you have to watch out for gets to be quite a bit. And so just to keep it a little bit more simpler, that's why we, we sort of made it immutable. But that's a great example of where you actually want to go in and change it. Right. Okay. The, uh, the, the third option to do filtering, uh, I mean, we covered, the first is the default, the second we covered is the filtering, that's what we call as the trigger filter. The third one is essentially, you can construct the query yourself. You can have a very complex query, you can join multiple objects, you can have multiple conditions to it, and that way you are essentially, I mean, you're taking on the burden of creating uh, this, uh, uh, this query, but then you get very fine control in terms of you know, what you see and what you don't see. Uh, so in languages that support a query language, we are Salesforce, uh, I think, I believe NetSuite, uh, so there, uh, ServiceNow. ServiceNow, there we support the ability to construct your query. So why would we do this? I mean, what is the, uh, you know, uh, of course, um, other than joining the data, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what is the point of actually adding filter conditions uh, using SoCo? Uh, I mean, um, 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 I mean, are, are you sort of referring to the schema benefits here? No, or no, what no, are you thinking? I mean, it's primarily because, you know, I guess there are two resources that you're trying to conserve, right? One is number of jobs that you're going to create at the, and, you know, within Workago, you could have filters. But if you have API limits, you know, uh, number of data, amount of data that you can get from the system. Mm -hmm. If you're filtering it at the source, then, you know, that is a, uh, you know, you would use those type of filtering because you're not hitting the, the Salesforce. Uh, because a number of rows that you, you get from Salesforce is already uh, filtered out, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking of that, uh, but yeah, I, I think um, uh, that, that's 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 a, a reason to do that as well. And uh, so I, I hope that sort of uh, made sense. I mean, there's multiple ways to uh, filter what you process um, and, and um, uh, you know, work out of, uh, uh, so, you know, depending on uh, your level of uh, comfort with, with the query language of the application you're working with, um, uh, you, you can do that. The, the next topic with uh, triggers is uh, um, schema and field selection. So, um, so this, this is now you have essentially the, the previous one, I mean, it may sound similar to what we just talked about, but the previous one is about filtering out entire objects and events. This one is about once, an, uh, once you receive an event or object that matches the conditions you specified, now within that object, how do you work with just a specific set of fields? Um, So I'm I'm uh, I'm put, uh, looking up. Uh, let, let's actually use this as an example. You already have this, okay. uh, oh, Which one? Sign one. Oh, so, cool, cool. so I'm going to turn this on. And um, so um, let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up. Some. So there's a couple of things at work here. I mean, here, uh, um, let's say I, I picked opportunity. Let me also pick. So uh, I, before going into uh, talking about sort of uh, the how, how do you narrow down the schema, I, I'll quickly talk about related objects. Let's say you're, in this case, you're working with opportunities um, um, as the, this is the object that's been selected, but an opportunity object is related to other objects. An opportunity is related to a, custo uh, a, a customer or an account. It may be back to a campaign. So, so in processing that recipe, we may actually need information from related objects as well. So one way to do that is 
in the on the action side, you could basically have an action that says go get this object. So you would be, you would have a multiple a set of gets that would fetch the object from Salesforce. But um, in Salesforce, especially because they actually support a powerful query language, you can also set it up in the trigger so that as part of the query, we can Workado can actually get the related objects as well. So that is what this does. So in this case, what we would do is we would so opportunity is a default because opportunity is what we have selected here. But we'll also pick up the account object. Um, and this way, downstream in your, uh, in your actions, you don't have to specifically get the account object. And once you do that, you can also specifically select the fields that you're interested in. I'm, I'm just going to pick a random set of fields. And, uh, and the prefix is the object, account ID is the object, and the field within that. And then you know I also selected some other so uh, so this is campaign ID and so what we did here is we basically said I'm interested in this object opportunity I'm interested in the objects that it is related to campaign and account and but I am only interested in this specific set of fields so now if you look at the output schema for this you will see just a much shorter list. So why, why do we actually have this functionality? Uh, this is definitely a functionality that we added after the fact, uh, is sometimes we run into objects that have 5,000 fields. Like QuickBase is a great example where you know, an object could have you know, thousands of fields. And uh, it, crea it sort of creates multiple problems when you're working with objects of that size. It, it, this, of course, applies only with when you're uh, working with a very large object, but you are really only focused on a handful of fields there, which is what we often see. We'll see this 5,000 um, column object in QuickBase, but users just care about 20 fields in it. So what this, uh, this uh, selection capability does is, first, it's just better user experience. You're not writing a whole bunch of get to get the related objects. Also, anytime you're doing mapping, you are not looking at 5,000 fields. You're just looking at the fields that you actually care about. So it just sort of declutters it for you. The other is performance. I mean, especially in cases where you're bringing that many fields over, but you're not using them, that is just a lot of wasted uh, compute and memory. So as you, uh, as you, got, uh, uh, you know, every Workato recipe runs in its own container. And, uh, you know, at some level, uh, um, the, the compute and memory available dictates what you can do with that recipe. Um, so, so performance is a big factor. And the last is uh, uh, insulating yourself from schema changes. So for example, in uh, Salesforce, they don't allow you to do a select star. You have to do select A, B, C, and so on. And then if you later on in your schema, if you got rid of B, then the query actually breaks. So, so specifying the fields that you want to uh, work with lets Workado create a more, uh, a more appropriate query. Otherwise, what Workado would have to do is if that particular object has 200 fields, we'd go field one, field two, comma, field one, comma, field two. That would be our query. And uh, we would go through the whole, uh, yeah, that's how we'd construct the query. And if there was a field that got deleted, the query actually would break. So this is a way to insulate yourself from, uh, from um, uh, schema changes. Gautam, uh, let's just uh, take a quick poll because we have maybe 10 more minutes or so. Oh, and okay. then there's a question that you can answer while we uh, launch this poll. Uh, mm -hmm. Folks, please uh, take a minute to answer this question that helps us improve the content and format of the product hours. Uh, and the question was, does, does is SQL query supported for QuickBooks? QuickBooks or QuickBase? Uh, QuickBooks. I don't know. No, no. So, OK. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, I, I, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. OK, Cyril, so we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to check on that and uh, respond to you over email. Any, anything else on, on, on sort of schema um, field selection, Harish? 
uh, this skill and insulation, uh, this probably applies, uh, I think, uh, Salesforce is kind of a, spe a special, uh, case. special case. And uh, uh, I guess, uh, especially for Salesforce recipes, this becomes something of significance. Right. That's right. Yeah. I, I, yeah, actually, now that sort of I mentioned that, also uh, the the performance improvement actually is on uh, on uh, two sides, both in processing the recipe itself. But we have seen several APIs where they they're from a product perspective. When you have an object with thousands of fields, the it is able to handle it. But their APIs, the same products APIs, because I mean, there's a couple that I, that I know that I I won't name that. They deliver very large XML documents, and uh, and um, so uh, the time we have noticed pretty significant latency. In fact, I mean, like in minutes, yeah. it, it takes some of them take five to six minutes actually to uh, to construct that and respond to your query. So that is the other advantage of having specifying this. It would, it would also help the applications API be more performant. So. Um, um, I mean, I think we are going to uh, run out of time, so I think uh, we uh, will we'll cover actions in the next uh, in the next session. So the the last part thing that uh, sort of we, we wanted to talk about was uh, uh, you know thinking a little bit about throughput. So when you have a recipe, the typical behavior, the default behavior that Workato provides is it will process one event at a time. And then you could use batching to further increase your throughput and you could say I want to process them a thousand at a time. But, um, uh, but then even then if you're moving millions of records that may not be sort of fast enough. So for example let's say you, your recipe takes a, a, a few seconds to run but you have one million records that you want to process every day at, at 10 a.m. and you don't want it to take several hours. So um, uh, so what you can do is, on top of batching, you can use parallel processing. So parallel processing essentially tells Workato that this particular recipe, I'm okay with running them uh, in parallel. I mean, the reason it, it is we don't do that by default is that because in you you may have a use case where the ordering matters, right? But sometimes ordering may not matter uh, when it comes to doing parallel processing. Workato cannot guarantee ordering because we, we, it is just it is, uh, that we, we are getting efficiency by doing them in parallel and ordering by definition will serialize it. Um, so what? Uh, um, uh, so in use cases where ordering doesn't matter and ordering doesn't matter for a lot of use cases, especially when you think about database uh, 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 interactions, data warehouse interactions, ordering we find is usually not that important. Um, and rarely do people do things like you know a equals you know uh, a plus five, right? Um, uh, or sorry, they don't do plus five on it. So, um, so what you can do is you can set the parallel processing levels on a per recipe basis. You can um, today we support a maximum of five. It's actually a more of a, a, a sort of a. Um, uh, it's not a the platform underlying platform can support more. But at this point, we expose a maximum of five. And what that tells um, the Workato is that process them five at a time. So in this particular use case, what that means is um, you're processing uh, in each batch a thousand records. And then here, you have a concurrency level of five. So basically, there are five pipelines that are allocated for to process this. So at, at any instance, you are processing 5,000 records. So this is a this is a way to increase increase your throughput, especially in the warehouse scenarios where in which you are simply moving data from uh, you know one source to another. Uh, this becomes uh, an important tool to increase the throughput. Right? Yeah, that, uh, yeah. So um, and, and this you know so for example, if something is taking thirty minutes. By running it in parallel, you know it is going to be 30 divided by five. I mean, most of the times you get that level of uh, sort of a performance. Uh, uh, it's a nearly linear performance increase. Um, also, the other thing that is, I think, worth talking about when thinking about throughput is also we've also seen use cases where a single recipe may make 400, 500 API calls. 
So when you are making that many API calls, your recipe or recipe job really is going to take a fair bit of time to actually process. And, uh, and there's not a lot of optimization you can get. So there, in those cases, sort of, we, we actually have written up some thoughts on how to think about it as in, if you're doing multiple searches um, uh, in, in, let's say, in Salesforce, how to actually you know, do that search once and reuse the, the, uh, the, the results of the search. Uh, especially, people, we see that when they're using a call process, which is one recipe calling another recipe, uh, if even when there is the same search result, they make the call two times instead of passing the results of the, the query that was done in the parent recipe to the child recipe. So all those things actually can make a big difference. Sometimes we've also seen in the same a compounded thing is uh, within a loop, they're calling search and actually the search code act in, in cases we have seen may, uh, does not really have to be in the loop. So we have seen use cases where there are several hundred API calls being made in a single recipe. So definitely those, uh, uh, that, you know, in those cases, parallel processing actually, will, will, you know, will help, but it's better to look at the recipe itself. I think if you feel that your job is taking too long, uh, you know, to pro uh, process, probably uh, it's a good idea to get in touch and see, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, uh, yeah, if you're sort of exhausted, uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 optimizations and it is, it's still not uh, uh, fast enough, uh, definitely uh, get in touch with us uh, and, um, and, and, you know, um, we, can, we can help. There's this uh, one question, this was uh, with regards to Eventbrite. So the use case is like any time a refund happens in Eventbrite, uh, the recipe is required to update the Salesforce opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's possible that uh, the refund event like may not be supported in the API. So what do you recommend? How should one go about it? So a uh, refund uh, is not supported in uh, Workato connector or the event uh, or the API itself does not support the re uh, 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 refund capabilities. So I don't know about the, what is in the case of Eventbrite, but I'm just mm -hmm. generic uh, use case, right? The, the API may not support it, or the, uh, the connector may not support it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, there is a triggering event, which is in this case a refund. So how should they go about getting that event if the connector doesn't support it? If the connector doesn't support it is an easy answer. I mean, okay. you can sort of add to it uh, okay. using our uh, custom uh, actions. You can add your own action for it, uh, or you can use the SDK for it, or you know, you can check with us because oftentimes some of those things are you know, could be in our roadmap already. Okay. When the API itself does not support it, um, there, there is not a whole lot uh, we could do. But what I have seen is I've seen this use case where there is a parent object and then there is a child object and then the child object uh, may not be directly accessible via API. Let's say, you know, a credit, a payment is a child uh, uh, object. But in those cases, we have actually seen that the parent itself supports it. So what you may have to do is instead of just thinking about it as a payment issue, you think about the parent object that it is related to, and you may be okay. able to do an update on that, and you update these fields in the parent object. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we are close to any closing notes before we conclude the webinar. Um, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, um, um, you know, if you, uh, triggers are, a bit of a complex topic, right? Um, and uh, I mean, uh, but it is sort of uh, easy to use, um, and we hope it is easy to use. But there is a lot of stuff that is going on under the covers, and I think that is it's kind of like a bit of an iceberg type thing where what you see is sort of things that's above the surface. But there's a ton of stuff that goes on in the back to provide that simplified experience. And, you know, definitely um, uh, we'd love to hear feedback about how we can make it even more simpler. Um, and, and also we have written up a fair bit about this in, in our documentation. So it's, there's definitely 
uh, you know, we uh, um, a, a lot of uh, content uh, there that hopefully helps you understand what is going on under the covers as well. Okay. Thanks, Gautam. Thanks, Harish. Uh, folks, thanks again for joining us in the webinar. Uh, like, um, you will find this uh, webinar posted on product.workata.com uh, later uh, this week or uh, on Monday. Uh, but any feedback, any questions, send us an email and we'll try to address that over email. And the next topic is we couldn't get to uh, covering actions, so we'll resume with actions in our next webinar. Thanks again. Uh, have a wonderful week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kyle.